We're going to look at Psalm 113 this morning and touch on the whole psalm in various measures. We're going to read verses 5 and 6 once more as the focal point of the psalm. We might say the window into which we look to see the message of the psalm. It's just a question right there in the middle of the psalm. Verses 5 and 6, who is like the Lord our God who is seated on high? who looks far down on the heavens and the earth. And in light of that question, we will consider the message of the entire psalm. By way of our amen to that message, we'll sing together the words of hymn 23. That's a rhymed version of what the Apostle Paul writes to the Philippians in chapter 2, that beautiful hymn about Christ, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped. I'll make reference to that also in the sermon. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, Psalm 113 begins and ends with the same word. What word is that? It's the word hallelujah. That should say something to us right away about this psalm, about its content and about its tone. Its tone. Can you even say the word hallelujah in a subdued tone, a somber tone? Doesn't it just beg to be burst out? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Well, that's the way we ought to read this psalm. Perhaps you noticed how many exclamation marks there even were in the translation. That's the way this psalm ought to be proclaimed. Problem is, I know that when I get excited, I get louder and I talk faster. So I'll have to be careful this morning, too, lest I lose you in the enthusiasm of this psalm. But this psalm is so full of the praise of the Lord that it's hard not to become exuberant and enthusiastic. And it all comes to a head in that question in the middle of the psalm, the question in the verses 5 and 6, which we took as the window in the psalm. It's a rhetorical question. Who is like the Lord our God? I know that at the moment... The students are learning from home, and that takes some adjusting, but you older students could still tell us, of course, what a rhetorical question is, right? Or maybe the learning environment in the home has thrown you off your game, and you don't remember what a rhetorical question is. But a rhetorical question is one that really doesn't need an answer. It's not looking for an answer. It's a question used for dramatic effect or to make a point. And the point is obvious in this context, I think, Psalm 113. There is no God like our God. That's the message we all have preached to us this morning under that question. Who is like the Lord our God? Well, here there is nothing too great in the first point, And there is no one too small in the second point. Who is like the Lord our God? There's first of all nothing too great. That question is a question the psalmist comes to ask after what he's just written. The Lord is on high above all nations and His glory above the heavens. In fact, He is seated on high, verse 5. That adds to it. It's not just that the Lord ranks high above the nations. This isn't some kind of social structure, some status level. The Lord is high above. No, it's an expression of God's sovereign rule. The one who is seated on high is the one who reigns over everything. He is seated on his throne. We just sang from Psalm 103, His holy throne the Lord in heaven has founded. From there He rules with sovereign power unbounded. His throne in heaven is founded. And there are many more psalms that express that. The king that lives in a time of unrest, 
he has very little time to sit on his throne. He has to lead his army in battle here and there. He has to put down this uprising and that uprising. It's only when he's firmly in control of his kingdom that he can sit on his throne. That's the image. The Lord is seated on high. He's on his throne, reigning in his kingdom over which he has full control. It's a throne that is well established. There's no uncertainty here in the legitimacy of his rule. There's no uncertainty in the constancy of his rule. It's well-founded, firmly established already in eternity. And so he's on high over all nations. The nations may have their own gods, Baal, Asherah, Dagon. Back in Egypt already, their gods of the Nile, Amun Re, Mut, Osiris, and more. And in later centuries, God's people would be confronted with them too, Zeus and Hermes and Artemis and more, all through the millennia. Because it says the Apostle Paul, mankind chose to serve the creature rather than the Creator. They suppress the knowledge of the truth. Yet the psalm proclaims that the truth remains. The Lord is on high above all nations. Even if they try to ignore him, even if they refuse to acknowledge him, even if their worldview just doesn't include him, he is high above all nations. In Canada... The U.S., China, India, Iraq, North Korea, Russia, Antarctica, wherever. There is no this God for you, this God for me, like our world today would have us believe. There is no one truth for you and one truth for me. There is one Lord who is seated on high. His glory is above the heavens. His glory. That's all the supernatural ways that God makes his presence known. The elders in Deuteronomy 5, verse 24, say, Behold, the Lord our God has shown us his glory and his greatness. God tucked Moses into the cleft of the rock and let his glory pass by. The glory of his presence filled the tabernacle or the sanctuary of the temple, Psalm 26, verse 8. It was manifested there in the cloud, Exodus 16, verse 11. The Lord who sits on high above all nations is there in all of his glory. Isaiah saw him there in a vision, his glory filling all the earth. He's there surrounded by brilliant and radiant light and, and all of it means that there is no one more important than he, no, more, no one more honorable, no one more powerful. It's no wonder the psalmist comes to that rhetorical question, who is like the Lord our God? Emphatically he is saying no one and nothing. There is nothing too great for him. He is seated on high. Well, in the New Covenant, we have to think of our Savior, Christ, seated on his throne at the right hand of God. He has all authority in heaven and on earth. It's a crazy world we live in. Sometimes we talk about the constant news feeds we have as more a curse than a blessing. We just get bombarded by all the brokenness. All the chaos and confusion in the world leaves people critical. Just think about the spread of COVID-19 and, and the restrictions and the reactions. Where is the Lord God? Who is in control? Anyone? Yes, beloved, it is a confession of faith of the psalmist, isn't it? When he says the Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. People do wonder sometimes. Christians too. But it's our confession of faith to say, I believe in God the Father Almighty. And in Jesus Christ ascended into heaven and sitting at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. It's a confession of faith. 
and what implications that has. Then we don't despair over confusion and chaos. We trust in his powerful control. Because the psalmist says very pointedly, who is like the Lord? Our God. It's not just the more general who is like the Lord God, but our God. This is the God that we are in a relationship with. The Lord Yahweh. He is our God. Because he has brought us into covenant with him. It was confirmed in our baptism. He said to us there too in our baptism, I am the Lord, your God. By faith in him and in our Lord Jesus Christ, we look at the world around us through those glasses. The Lord, our God, is seated on high. Things might look messy sometimes. But that's not because it's slipped his attention. Or certain matters are are falling through his fingers or, or he blinked his eyes and missed something. Not at all. He is fulfilling his purpose. A purpose I may not always know, but he's fulfilling that purpose, working unfailingly towards the day of the great restoration of all things. He remains the Almighty God, having full authority in heaven and on earth because he made it all. That's not an unreasonable faith, irrational faith. It's not that we're just grasping at something to hang on to in all the chaos. No creation, for one, testifies to his glory. Just think of the glorious sunsets even around these parts when the setting, the situation is right. The cloud formations and the purple glow as the sun begins to set over the horizon. It's glorious. The brightest stars that begin to twinkle already in the still blue sky. The the heavens, they declare the glory of God. But so does his work among the nations. Think, for example, of the persecuted church. In the very nations where Christ's church is being persecuted the most, it grows the fastest. History has shown it. That can't be credited to anything else but the Lord's work. It's otherwise totally counterintuitive. doesn't make any human sense. Oppressed groups otherwise begin to disappear. People don't join them. And yet the number of faithful Christians is only increasing in China, for example. The Lord is high above all nations. Let them struggle and strive against him. It's all in vain. The one in heaven laughs. It's just to illustrate the truth of the psalmist's question. Who is like the Lord our God? There is nothing too great for him. And that's why the psalm begins with the call to praise. That has to be our response. Praise. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. That's a call, especially to the covenant people of God to start. Servants of the Lord. The word servants there is not just for the office bearers in the Old Testament, the priests and Levites or the elders and deacons in our churches today. No, all God's people can be called servants of the Lord. It's the privilege and the obligation, if you will, of the covenant, the promise and the demand. Covenant people are servants of the Lord. What a privilege. Called to praise We all who've been baptized and are servants of the Lord called to praise. There's that promise and obligation. Praise him for his glory. Praise him for his power. Praise him for his majesty. Praise him for his honor. Praise him for his enthronement. All that is captured in the name of the Lord. Verses 1, 2, and 3. His name is his reputation. 
A reputation he gains from his words and from his works. It's a call to praise that moves to all times and all peoples and all places. From this time forth and forevermore, from the rising of the sun to its setting. Notice those words, beloved, from this time forth. That's from right now. Right this moment. Don't put off your praise. Don't wait until you have your life together, until you've dealt with this or you've fixed that or, or whatever delay we come up with in our minds of waiting to more fully praise God. From this time forth and forevermore, as long as there's a today, because there may not be a tomorrow, from the rising of the sun to its setting, from east to west that spans the whole earth. What started with a call to the servants of the Lord, the covenant people of God, becomes a call to the whole earth. And isn't that the way it already was, always was, that God's people would be the channel of his blessing to all peoples? Was the promise to Abraham, in you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. The more God's own people praise him, the more that praise moves through the whole earth. That's how the light shines in this darkness. That's how the salt has its effect. Praise the Lord. Praise him because nothing is too great for him. We ought to appreciate that truth more and more. Then it will move us to praise him too because no one is too small for him. That's what we hear in the second point. We have to read verse 6 carefully so that we don't miss the point. Who is like the Lord our God, the psalmist asks, who is seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth? Some of you might enjoy hiking. A good climb up a high hill or, or maybe in the mountains can afford you sometimes this glorious lookout that often attracts people. When you go for a drive in certain areas, there are many places you can pull over. There's a lookout point. Advertise it at the road. When you're up high, that can offer you a nice vantage point to look down on all that surrounds you below you. It's one of the exhilarating things about flying I always find. When you're going up or beginning to come down, you get a bird's eye view of that hustle and bustle of life on earth. These little cars seemingly crawling along on the highways, landmarks that might stand out. You pick these things out from this high elevation. It's all so small. Now I put all that into your minds only to say don't think like that. Don't think like that when you read verse 6. The Lord is seated on high, we heard. In all his majesty and glory and power and splendor, and he is enthroned over heaven and earth. But then when it says, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth, it's not like your view from the mountain top or from that descending airplane. That's not what the psalmist wants you to praise God for. Otherwise, what follows in the psalm doesn't quite follow. No, better is the way it's expressed in the NIV, for example, who stoops down to look on the heavens and the earth. Or the New American Standard Bible, who humbles himself to behold the things that are in heaven and on earth. The Lord our God, seated on high, doesn't just look down from his high place. He comes down so that he can see it all more closely and intimately. He comes down. The high and holy humbles himself. He did that, didn't he, brothers and sisters? Our all man song to the sermon is hymn 23 from Philippians 2. That hymn of Christ Jesus, who, 
though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even on a cross. Who is like the Lord our God? He is seated on high. He humbles himself. He stoops down so low. We read a verse like this, and we see Jesus, the Son of God, emptied of his glory, enduring the cross. His soul was in such anguish in the garden that he pleaded, Lord, if it is possible, take this cup from me. He was sorrowful to the point, death. Yet not my will be done, but your will. He went to the cross willingly. And on that cross, suffering God forsakenness so that we might never more be forsaken by him. All to save us from our sin. While we were still his enemies, sinners, Christ died for us. So low. He stooped. When he satisfied God's wrath for our sin, he dealt with our greatest need. Sin had separated us from this high and holy God. But in Christ we are brought near, blood-bought people of God, now belonging to him, to his family. It's what our baptism signifies. The washing with water and the washing away of our sins in the blood of Christ. That highlights God's grace again. His grace revealed in that name, the Lord, Yahweh, the I am who I am, the one who is faithful to his promises. Who is like the Lord our God? who is enthroned, that he would enter into a relationship like this with weak, sinful creatures by sending his own son to suffer and die in our place. And if God did not spare his own son, how will he not with him graciously give us all things? Is there anything, anyone who is too small for God? If he stoops down to meet our need from sin, will he not stoop down to provide for all our needs? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. You can feel the motion there. The one who is enthroned on high stoops down, comes down to the poor in the dust, the needy in the ashes, and lifts them up. It's to describe total squalor and misery. The poor often sift through the garbage, the grime and dirt and dust to find meager morsels. The needy warm themselves around a constantly warming fire, sitting in the spreading ashes. It's all they have. Yet God delights in raising them up from their poor and lowly places to sit them with, sit them with the high and mighty, the paupers to princes. And it's true. We have a hard time relating to that sometimes in our affluent Western culture. But to see the joy in the faces of those who are impoverished, yet know Christ, it's amazing. It touches your heart. It's even sometimes shaming. When we have so much, they so little, Yet the evident joy in their faces at knowing Christ, that's what matters. It doesn't only have to be the materially poor, though. Listen to David in Psalm 40, verse 17. As for me, I am poor and needy. But the Lord takes thought for me. David wasn't the poor in the dust, the needy in the ash heap. 
But in his struggle against his enemies, against oppression, he is poor and needy. Life's circumstances can leave us feeling that way. What riches we have in Christ. But some really struggle to cling to those riches, to experience those riches. Misery leaves us wrestling, the poor and needy. The Lord stoops down and sees us there too. David knows that in Psalm 40 as well. He says, I am poor and needy, but the Lord takes thought for me. God the Lord provides for our greatest need. But then he doesn't ignore just the other needs. Just think about what Jesus did when he was on earth too. He came, the one, he came, the one who knew no sin, to be sin for us. And then while he was here, he provided for far more needs too, didn't he? He made the lame to walk, the blind to see, the deaf to hear. He, he healed the sick. He drove out demons. He raised the dead. He had compassion on the people. His, he wept for them. His heart went out to them. God knows our needs and cares for them. There is no one too small. No one who can say, God doesn't see me, little me. I'm too insignificant for him. He takes pleasure in reversing the fortunes of his people. He raises the poor. He lifts up the needy. Sometimes we soothe ourselves by saying, well, in the grand scheme of things, it's, I guess it's not that big a deal. Or we try to comfort others that way. And maybe there is some truth to that. Maybe in the grand scheme, whatever you're dealing with is not that big a deal. But is everything always about the grand scheme? Doesn't the psalmist praise the Lord our God here because the very one who is seated on high, who is in control of that grand scheme, is also interested in the small details, the things that are a big deal to, to me, to you. Maybe in the big picture, my present struggle seems insignificant, and maybe it is. Paul speaks, too, about our light momentary affliction, 2 Corinthians 4. But what about in the moment? It's significant to me. Who is like the Lord our God? He looks far down on the heavens and the earth, and he sees me and knows me here in my struggle with chronic disease in my battle with dark depression, in my longing for a life partner, in my tears for straying children, in my sorrow over a suffering marriage, in you sit there in your homes and you're listening and any number of things goes through your head. I can't spell them all out for everyone who's listening. The things that God's children carry around. But the psalmist picks out a particular example. He gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. The history of God's people is sprinkled with examples of that. Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, Manoah's wife, Hannah, Elizabeth. And that's just selecting the biblical examples. Actually, part of Psalm 113 is almost word for word an echo of the song of Hannah in 1 Samuel 2. There was a stigma attached to being a barren woman. Yet God is the creator and giver of life, and he can even bring healing and the hurt there. And he has many times. What a particular joy it is for women like Hannah as she sings to know the ache of an empty womb and to have that filled with a child, a joyous mother of children. For it is to be a joy to have children, isn't it? The Ports, the Van Pikerens, the Brucklemans, they're all mentioned in the news for today. All these children, they come as an awesome responsibility, weighing upon our hearts and minds as parents. 
They'll bring their trials, conceived and born in sin as they are. Yet they are a blessing more than a burden to fill a mother's heart, a father's heart with joy. What a joy God can bring. Maybe not always into the barren womb, but still always the precious gifts of the giver of life. So if God can do all these things, why doesn't he always? Isn't that the question that needles our minds? Not just about having children that likely touches a close cord for, for some of you. But the other examples I gave too, if he can do all these things, if he's so interested in us, why not? These verses aren't saying that God always does this. It also doesn't say that if he does, he'll do it quickly. Just think of Joseph, Job. Sometimes he only does it after death. Think of Lazarus in Jesus' parable, the poor man at Abraham's side. It's all to say what the Lord can do, what he delights in doing, what he will do ultimately for his people in the end. The Lord our God will graciously meet all the needs of his people. If not in this life, then certainly in the life to come. Behold, I make all things new, Revelation 21. Of that, we get a glimpse here. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The psalmist has to conclude with that. Praise the Lord. It comes bursting out again. Who is like the Lord our God? There is nothing too great for Him, no one too small. He's revealed it all to us in the gift of His Son. He, who has authority over all things, had humbled Himself so low. He had compassion on his people. He provided for all our needs. Praise the Lord. Such great power and goodness and love requires our praise. And how will you do that, beloved? In all your words and works. We say that quickly sometimes, don't we? Meaning to cover everything in all your words and works. And it's true. But then sometimes we hide in the generalities, don't we? That's kind of vague. Praise Him in all your words and works. That is, praise Him with prayer. Praise Him with singing. Praise Him with a life of thankful obedience. Praise Him with your family at home. Praise Him in the way you do your schoolwork. Praise Him with your day job. Praise Him in the landscape. Praise Him with the laundry. Praise Him in your fellowship and friendship with others. Praise Him in remembering His work. Praise Him in meditating on His Word. Praise Him in all your words, honest words, truthful words, gentle words, loving, admonishing words. Let even your eating and drinking, whatever you do, be to the praise of our God. To God alone be the praise. Soli Deo Gloria. Hallelujah. Amen. 